I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about acetylcholine and ADHD. What's the connection? So as usual, I'll start with the take-home message, and the take-home message is that acetylcholine is a major neurotransmitter system, and it's been relatively neglected in ADHD treatment. Now, it's a tremendously important system in both the body and the brain, at the neuromuscular junction, it's involved in the parasympathetic nervous system, as well as circuitry within the brain. It's implicated in the number of circuits that affect or control executive functions. And there's been some research and medications designed for Alzheimer's and schizophrenia. Nicotine is the best studied drug that activates acetylcholine receptors. And there is some evidence that nicotine can be beneficial for ADHD, but not a lot more research or drug development so far. And that may be changing because there's a brand new schizophrenia medicine called Cobenfi that acts on the acetylcholine receptors in the brain, and it particularly seems to enhance cognitive functioning. It's the first non-dopamine drug for schizophrenia in decades, and it's possible that research and interest in Cobenfi are related to acetylcholine because of Cobenfi may usher in a new wave of acetylcholine treatments for other conditions, including ADHD. So what is acetylcholine? It's a neurotransmitter, again, that's used extensively in the brain and the body. Structurally, acetylcholine, the acetyl is acetic acid, vinegar, and choline, which is a building block of phospholipids, which are fatty molecules that are essential building blocks of cell membranes. So structurally, this doesn't look like dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine. It's chemically a different type of receptor. And there are two big types of receptor systems that bind acetylcholine. And each of these systems is named after the plant sources or where it was originally found in nature. So there's a nic nicotine system where the nicotine from tobacco and other plants binds to nicotine re acetylcholine receptors. And the nicotine receptor is a fast ion channel receptor. So when nicotine or acetylcholine binds to that receptor, ions flow in and out and change membrane potentials and activate nerve cells. The other major group of acetylcholine receptors are called muscarinic. These are named for Amanita muscaria, a type of mushroom, a somewhat toxic mushroom, and it is a slow second messenger system. So it's not changing ions flow, it's sending a second messenger, which then subsequently produces effects in the secondary cell. So in the body, acetylcholine is incredibly important because at every single neuromuscular junction, that's where your nerves connect to the muscle to make it contract voluntarily. So with the, the voluntary skeletal muscle system, those are all nicotinic acetylcholine receptors right there. The parasympathetic nervous system, so again, that's the rest and digest system that counters the fight or flight sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system, throughout most of its extent, uses muscarinic acetylcholine receptors, but there's some few what are called autonomic ganglion. So those are clusters of cell bodies, relay points along the parasympathetic nervous system that do use nicotine at those ganglions. In the brain, there's both nicotine and muscarinic receptors. The nicotine receptors are more sparsely found, but are present in cortex, hippocampus, amygdala, and the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors are more abundant, particularly in several parts of the cortex, frontal cortex, temporal cortex, parietal cortex, and occipital cortex. Many of them are in either the midbrain or the basal forebrain. Some in the basal forebrain send projections up to the cortex and up to the hippocampus deep in the brain. Those seem to be involved in learning and memory are not essential for those processes. There's also a cluster of cells in the frontal forebrain called the basal nucleus of minor. Cells project to the neocortex, that prefrontal cortex, and those are essential for attention processes, memory processes, arousal. They're also involved in reward and motivation pathways. Acetylcholine is important for synaptic plasticity, so changing the connections between nerve cells. And it's also important in the brain when the brain is being set up and developed. Acetylcholine 
helps direct or control what connections are being made. In terms of conditions or illnesses related to acetylcholine, there's one neurologic condition called myasthenia gravis, which is associated with slow or frozen moving, difficulty moving, particularly in when it's warmer. And myasthenia gravis, we know, is caused by antibodies to the nicotinic neuromuscular junction receptor. So it's mucking up the connection between a nerve and a muscle. Alzheimer's is another prominent condition which, where destruction of acetylcholine neurons are one of the earliest or most extensive pathological findings early on. And that's why cholinesterase inhibitors were developed. I'll get to those in a minute to treat Alzheimer's. Again, acetylcholine systems are important in a host of other mental health conditions, including ADHD, including schizophrenia. So jumping into drugs that mess with or affect the acetylcholine system, the earliest drugs that did this, or medications, were poisons. So many plants, plant poisons are acetylcholine anticholinergic drugs, so blocking the acetylcholine receptors. So deadly nightshade, and nightshade is in the family with potatoes, tomatoes, and eggplants from the belladonna plant. And belladonna actually means beautiful woman. And it's called that because during the Renaissance days, the women used eye drops containing nightshade to dilate their pupils. So blocking the acetylcholine allows norepinephrine to act unimpeded, which is a dilating of the pupils. But taking it systemically into your body causes a host of symptoms. So there's a medical school saying, mad as a hatter, dry as a bone, red as a beet, something else. So anticholinergic poisoning results in parasympathetic nervous system not working well. So it slows down digestion, heart rate goes up, your skin is dry because you're not sweating, your body temperature goes up so you turn red, and delirium or including hallucinations, and the hallucinations, there's two characteristic types associated with anticholinergic. One is called Lilliputian hallucinations, where everything seems to be small or miniaturized, and also picking at imaginary objects. The nightshade plant isn't the only one that, that makes anticholinergic toxins, so jimson weed, mandrake root, datura, and bergmansia, those are the big Trumpet flowers on a shrub sized bush. Many of them have been used not just as poisons, but as hallucinogenic experience, trippy experiences. But clearly, there's a danger of going too far, getting too big a dose. We also have some drugs that are anticholinergic. So, there's some specific medications like tropium, which is prescribed to control overactive bladder. And there's other anticholinergics that are used to treat chronic structural pulmonary disease. The most common, probably, use of anticholinergics, certainly in psychiatry, though, is to give them to people who are having movement disorders from antipsychotics that are blocking the dopamine 2 receptors too successfully, even though they're targeting dopamine receptors that affect cognition and emotional control. They can affect movement related dopamine systems as well. Inadvertently, there's a number, though, of medications that have anticholinergic actions that weren't particularly targeted or desired. So antihistamines, including Benadryl, is a quite a potent anticholinergic drug. Certain antidepressants, particularly tricyclics, norotriptyline, which is one of the tricyclics for its norepinephrine reopaque action, can be used for ADHD but it also has anticholinergic action. In medicine, since at least the time I've been practicing, one of the most important concerns is, particularly in the elderly, avoiding any drugs that are adding to the anticholinergic burden because there's fairly good evidence that long-term use of anticholinergic, anticholinergic drugs has contributory factor for dementia, certainly for cognitive dysfunction, and again, the early, one of the early pathological features of Alzheimer's disease is diminishment in acetylcholine within the brain, particularly in the forebrain, and loss of acetylcholine cell bodies at the base of the 
for a brain. We do have some drugs that work the opposite way, that boost the acetylcholine system. Cholinesterase inhibitor is a drug that blocks the breakdown of acetylcholine, so more of it can exist for a longer time and be active. So there's three different cholinase, cholinesterase inhibitors that are used for ADHD, donopezol, galantamine, rivastigmine. There is one study looking at galantamine for ADHD, and there was not any significant benefit. That doesn't prove these drugs would be ineffective. It just means with that population, at that dosage, we didn't see a differentiation from placebo. So other drugs that work with the acetylcholine system, one of them is, is a pretty ubiquitous substance, nicotine. A handful of studies showing nicotine can have benefits for ADHD. It can have benefits on inattentive symptoms. It can have benefits for emotional regulation symptoms, at least some effects immediately, like a stimulant does. So within hours of taking the nicotine or minutes to hours, there are at least some studies which show a sustained benefit over at least four weeks. There's some studies showing that nicotine can benefit, reduce ADHD symptoms in both smokers and non-smokers. About a decade ago, there were at least four or five different nicotine acting agents in different stages of development, several of them by Abbott, so posanacline, sofenicline. Some of these did reach phase three studies which showed efficacy for ADHD and trying to track down why these were discontinued. There's suggestive indications that sorfinicline, some patients developed Stephen Johnson rash, a potentially lethal rash. There's also suggestion that too many people had peripheral cholinergic effects, so particularly gastrointestinal effects, making them undesirable. Varenicline, which is brand name Chantix, which was approved more than a decade ago to stop smoking. There are some case reports that some individuals with ADHD have gotten rapid and dramatic benefits from varenicline. There's also more studies published on whether varenicline works for smoking cessation among those with ADHD, it does, and whether stimulants may block the anti-smoking effect, at least it might. No randomly controlled studies looking at Varenicline to see whether it helps with ADHD. In my clinical experience, I've seen varenicline be extremely helpful for smoking cessation, much more powerfully than any other agent than nicotine or bupropion. When I've used it in several people with ADHD, they did not note any change in their ADHD symptoms. One other drug that's used occasionally for ADHD is bupropion or Welbutrin. And in addition to being primarily a norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake inhibitor, it does block some nicotine receptors. So it's blocking in this case in the brain, whether that has effects for its benefit for ADHD or whether in some people that may nullify its benefits, it's unclear. New drug on the block is called Cobenfi. It's celebrated, it was approved last year by the FDA for treating schizophrenia. It was touted widely as first new mode of action for treating schizophrenia in 50 years. That's technically correct. I put in a case, a case could be made for hemovancerin or nuplazid, which was approved in 2016. It's only been approved for psychosis, hallucinations and delusions in the setting of Parkinson's disease. There is research showing that nuplazid also works for schizophrenia, psychosis arising from other origins. And nuplazid also does not have any direct dopamine action. It is an inverse agonist of serotonin to A receptors. So that aside, so what is this new drug, Cobenfi? Combination of two drugs, insanomelene, which is a muscarinic agonist, and trospium chloride, which is a muscarinic antagonist. So why are you giving drugs that are one an agonist and one an antagonist working two different ways? The issue here is the different penetration to different parts of the body. So xanomelene goes readily into the brain. There's studies going back to 1997 showing it helped significantly with at least one six-month study of people with Alzheimer's, primarily acting on M1 and M4 receptors in the brain. But if you give, again, a general 
muscarinic boosting drug that's going to have parasympathetic effects throughout the body and primarily gastrointestinal effects. The trospium that's added here is a drug that does not get into the brain very well. So it is primarily blocking muscarinic action in the periphery throughout the body. And trospium is a drug that's already been approved many years ago for overactive bladder as a track record for safety and efficacy. So again, the two together are to try to not affect muscarinic receptors throughout the rest of the body, but to target muscarinic receptors in the frontal cortex. Studies for Cobenfi for schizophrenia that allowed it to be approved in 2024 show that it clearly helps with the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, which are the hallucinations and delusions. Most of our dopamine 2 blocking drugs do that, or they all do that. But more impressively, it worked on the other two categories of schizophrenic symptoms. So those are what are called the negative symptoms, where people are apathetic and not speaking much. Cognitive symptoms, which are also prominent in schizophrenia. So the cognitive boosting effects really excited and attracted researchers to do more with this drug because Almost none of the other agents for schizophrenia do much at all for either the negative symptoms or the cognitive symptoms. Common side effects, though, of this drug are nausea, constipation, vomiting, hypertension. So some signs that, at least in some people, we're not quite getting the balance right of how much blocking peripheral acetylcholine and how much boosting centrally. Maybe for some people, these drugs will never work. Maybe it would be better to have the two drugs separately so you could titrate them separately. And of the sort of frontline doctors who are using this already for schizophrenia, many of them are saying that this drug should be titrated more slowly than the companies recommended because some people do adjust to some of these gastrointestinal and other side effects. So the other thing with Cobenfi, which may be why they might start focusing on other uses of it, is there was a Another large phase three trial. The approval of Cobenfi is for treating schizophrenia. What they were seeking approval for with the second set of studies was using it as an augmenting agent with an antipsychotic of a different class, so a dopamine 2 blocking agent. So using the two together to treat schizophrenia, at least in the large study, it was just released in, or not released, pre released findings by the company released in April of 2025 was that it did not seem to add much benefit overall at a statistical level to a dopamine 2 blocking agent. So it may be that they wind up pulling back from investigations there, but keep going ahead with studies for ADHD. The past is already scattered with other drugs that worked on acetylcholine systems that never made it to market, even though they did seem to have some efficacy. So that's all I have to say for right now. Stay healthy, stay happy.